Hello and welcome to I Know That Voice, the podcast with voices you know, telling you stories you don't. We're kicking off the series, uh, as the commentator might say, in scintillating fashion with one of the most familiar and trailblazing voices ever to grace the BBC Airwaves. For Five Live, she's done it all, from covering seven Olympic Games and countless England test matches, to presenting weekend and weekday breakfast shows, as well as fronting the radio coverage of royal funerals and weddings. She's a two-time sports broadcaster of the year, a lover of choral music and a massive gooner. Known to some as the queen of tail enders, to others the first lady of fighting talk. She is quite simply radio royalty and she's our first guest on I Know That Voice. Eleanor Aldroyd, thank you so much for joining us in these wonderful podcast studios. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm very happy to see you, Will, and slightly embarrassed by that introduction because it feels like... I thought you like would be. Very, you know, it feels like I've... I've done a lot over very many years, which is probably true. And and the, the years feel like a, a lot of years. But no, it's great to be here. And thank you for inviting me. So what does a week in the life of a radio legend look like? What have you been up to <laughs> over the past few days? Well, this week has been... I mean, there is no typical week, I suppose. That's the, that's the number one right. thing. Um, because during the summer, I'm doing a lot of cricket. So I might be thinking, what day is it today? It is... Tuesday today, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I might be two days out from the start of a test match, perhaps, because, of course, test matches have to start on Thursday. It's, it's the law. Yeah. If any other day is not acceptable, but anyway. Um, but um, so I might be doing some prep for that, you know, reading up some stats about the teams, um, getting prepared to do updates for Radio 5 Live. Um, or actually on this week, I'm on a day off because it's the winter time. So I'm doing weekend breakfast. I'm doing Thursday night 5 Live sport. Um, so I work 10, my weeks are kind of, quite heavily weighted towards the weekend, really, in work terms. Um, but then, yes, I, as you said, I might be preparing for a royal occasion. Um, there's actually the, the Commonwealth Service at Westminster Abbey in, in a month's time, just under a month's time, okay. which I'm commentating for. So, so there is no such thing as a typical week. That's it's really exciting. And we're going to get into the nitty gritties of how you prepare for those different events. But just a one-off question to start. What do you most enjoy about the stuff that you do? I think the thing I most enjoy is the variety of it, really. Um, I've never particularly wanted to have a show, which I do every day. I wouldn't want to do a five-day-a-week breakfast programme or drive-time programme or anything like that because I think you then feel like your routine, you know, you, you lose some, some of the enjoyment of it, I think. But actually, it is the variety. I mean, I love the cricket. Um, I've only really in the last few years been doing regular cricket sort of throughout the whole summer. Um, even though it was what I originally wanted to do when I first started out in my career. That was my ambition, was to be a cricket journalist. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I like the variety of it, really. I like doing news, I like doing sport, I like banging on about choral music, I like all of these things. All of these things are going to be banged on about mm -hmm. together today. So cricket, your first love. Mm. Can you take us back to where it all began? When did you start loving cricket? What are your earliest memories of that? Well, I mean, like all the great rom-coms, it is actually Valentine's Day that we're recording today. Yeah, it so is. It couldn't be That's more perfect. True. Wow. Um, like all great rom-coms, it's sort of started with hate and then turned to love. Or maybe hate's too strong a word for it. Right. But my dad was incredibly into his cricket and my, my brother's were as well. I'm, actually, my mum was too, in fact. So it was, as I was growing up, I grew up in a rural vicarage. My dad was a vicar. Um, and the cricket was on the telly or on the radio all the time in the summer. Um, and, I, you know, and initially I fought against it and I thought, why do I want to watch this incredibly boring sport? Because back in those days, it was all the longer, longer formats of the yeah, game. Yeah, there was no hundred back there in the day. There was no hundred back in the day. So you really did have to sit down and focus on the whole day of a test match and it would be happening all day long and um and I didn't and the reason that I wasn't into it was because I didn't understand it you know and with anything the more the more you understand it the more accessible it becomes so I sat down one summer with my dad um I think it was probably about summer of 1975 or 76 and said will you please explain the game to me you know why are there six balls in an over why are there two batsmen why are there two bowlers um and so he did very patiently explained it all to me and then I can completely flipped it was like a switch. Um, and actually, that summer of 1976 was the great summer of the West Indies Fire in Babylon series. So, you know, Viv Richards, Michael Holding, Andy Roberts, Clive Lloyd, you know, they were the, the most dynamic, exciting team to watch. And and also there were a lot of stories around the England team then as well. So Tony Gregg, who was a South African born captain, who made these terrible remarks, which were... I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know quite why he said it, but he said, we're going to make this team grovel. 
That's right. And it played, of course, unbelievably badly in every sense. Um, so, and, but there was, you know, the emergence in that time of Ian Botham the following year. So, so I really got into it. Um, my dad took me to Lords for the first time in 1977 to my first Test match, which was an Ashes Test match where it rained all day. Pretty much, I think we saw about eleven overs bowled in the whole day, but but then I was hooked, and I thought actually, if I could find a way that I could watch cricket all day and get paid for it, then that would be my dream way of spending the rest of my life. I can relate to that very much. Um, and here we are, all these years on. That's really interesting because my sister had a similar kind of epiphany experience. I think over mm. lockdown, where cricket was actually the only thing on, mm. and I think it's when she got into the narrative of the sport because. You really get to know the players in cricket because they're on the field for so long. Mm. And I suppose that's why documentaries like The Test have worked so well. Mm -hmm. You kind of get to know the flow of the game. And it's almost like a Netflix series in and of itself, a test match. So it's, yeah. but you have to, you have to kind of go for it. I guess, what, what would your tip be, just, just an offhand to people now who are trying to get into cricket or dads who have daughters who aren't into cricket yet but you know there's a bit of hope there well I always feel like actually I have quite a you know sort of sense of responsibility if you like or, or a kind of almost evangelical need to sit down with people at cricket and say you know you might not understand it now but let me tell you about it and ask me any question you want no question is too stupid um, and and so I always feel this this need to really just try and explain in simple terms um, you know, about the personalities, I mean, you're quite right that there are so many interesting personalities in the game. I mean, can, particularly in this current England team, you know, you've got you've got the old guard, you've got Stuart Broad and grumpy Uncle Jimmy Anderson, you know, <laughs> and you've got Ben Stokes, who is who is this uh, never say die, throwing everything into it, you know, fiery redhead. Um, so so I think if you can. And, and I, actually, I think things like the hundred make it easier. And I think people have kind of have this this cut off where they think I can't I can't possibly understand it because the rules are too complicated. And you know, and there's uh, um, let's not talk about the hundred too much because otherwise we're going to be here all day. But people who say the hundred is a it's a it's a format we don't need. You know, nobody needs this game. If you say we don't need the hundred, you're talking from a position of understanding Test cricket and loving other form, formats of the game. But for people who say cricket is not for me. You know, and I've done this a few times, you know, with friends who said, well, maybe I'm thinking maybe I might take my kids to see a bit of the 100. So, well, actually, it's very easy to understand because, you know, you've got 100 balls. You score as many runs as you can within those 100 balls. And then the other team has got 100 balls to try and beat that score. Right. And actually, the Brit Awards nicked the 100's branding. I don't know if you saw that, but all the <laughs> graphics at the back were well, 100 graphics. They're clearly, I don't know, something's well, working. They're mm. breaching the usual boundaries um but let's talk about again your story and so your, your 1976 was when your dad kind of broke through to you that cricket was the best thing and then you were at school weren't you when your dad took you to your first cricket yeah match. that's Is that right, right. So tell me about that story yeah well my i needed to get a day off school to go and watch the, the test match at lords um and so my dad wrote to my my head teacher um and it was quite quite a kind of an academic school in oxford girls school um and said um, I've got, you know, I would like to take Eleanor out of school f for a day. She has expressed a desire to be the first woman cricket correspondent to the Times. And so I think this would be an educational visit. There you go. And, <laughs> and it was a great line. And I don't think I had actually said that at the time at all. I think he probably planted that seed in my head. But my head, I mean, the head teacher, I think, to be, to be fair to her, she absolutely said, well, of course, you know, why, sh why should she not want to be anything she wants to be? You know, any career is accessible to the girls at this school, which is a very forward thinking way of approaching it, I think. So, so yeah, so she gave me the day off school. But I think that was probably, as I said, the start of that idea that actually sports journalism or cricket journalism would be something that I could pursue and would bring me to my end goal. And then you pursued it at Cambridge University and joined the paper, was it? The yeah, university that's right. Paper? Yes, yes. Um, now, now called Varsity, but at the time it's called Stop Press. But um, yes, I became sports editor in the second year. So the first year I was I was there, I wrote about hockey. Um, actually, interestingly, the sports editor in my first year was also a woman at my college. So when you think back then, wow. it feels like very unenlightened times. But but actually, she was an absolutely obsessive sports fan as well. So she 
brought me into it, you know, gave me hockey to cover, but she was a mad cricket fan. So I wasn't touching cricket in the first year. She wasn't letting me anywhere near it. So in the second year, I then became sports editor myself and then I could pick and choose exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and that led me to um, one rainy day at Fenner's in- interviewing David Gower, yeah. which was the first proper interview I ever did. Wow. Um, I know, it's kind can of start quite high. Do you remember what you asked him? Uh, th- somewhere I've got the cutting and oh, well, um, really? it was, awesome. yeah, which which was, I, I, mean, I read it back now and I think that was very, very gushing. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> proper, proper fangirl stuff. Um, it's a bit it, like me and Eleanor, I'm quite a fangirl <laughs> at the moment, to be honest. <laughs> got to keep um, the lid on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, the, but he was charming. I mean, he was absolutely lovely of course as you can imagine as he still is i mean he's very 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 nice guy and you know it's been great to get to know him in in later life as well um so that was that was a great thing to start with and um and then when i graduated actually i applied for jobs in newspapers and didn't get anywhere at all you know i, I think it was partly because there wasn't it wasn't a course like the one here at city you know there weren't that very many that, that many postgraduate courses but anyway i done i done a three year degree and i wanted to get started um and actually my first opening was in local radio and that's where i started in local radio in worcester um with again a brilliant editor who you know when i said i wanted to cover cricket didn't say well you're a girl these things don't happen said of course off you go go down to new road and you know, reporting every hour. Do you remember that first trip down to New Road and what it was like? I can remember those early days of going down to New Road yeah. and feeling a, quite intimidated because at that... Well, intimidated, but at the same time not intimidated because the press box was just full of men um, and there was no sort of... You know, we didn't have a soundproof booth like this. Um, so we were in the main press box, main press area, um, and all the guys who were there had never seen a woman in the press box before. So I just wow. think I, I just think probably I don't don't really quite know how I had the, you know, the daring to to do it and to think, yes, I can do this. I can report on on cricket. And, and actually quite early on, one of the guys I was sitting next to turned around to me about halfway through the, through the first day and said, um, you do know what you're talking about, don't you? Wow. Because <laughs> obviously he'd assumed that. Yeah, you, that they'd send the wrong person by about. some mistake. You know, Radio Wyvern had lost their mind and sent some woman along who clearly, by the you know fact of being female, couldn't possibly understand the LBW law. Wow. So, so it was quite a. It was you know it was, it was lots of little knockbacks, but also lots of moments to build confidence as well. And lots of significant people who put their faith in you and absolutely. gave you that opportunity to just go because That's they knew absolutely. that you loved what you were doing yeah absolutely right and, and I think we all need people who have faith in us and, and give us opportunities fantastic so mm-hmm. it's BBC Shropshire is that right so Radio Wyvern in, in Worcester was my first one that was commercial commercial station then I went to Radio Shropshire um, after about 18 months at Radio Wyvern um, and and but went as their sports producer so covering a bit of cricket a bit of football I mean it's minor counties cricket in, in Shropshire a um, little bit of you know Shrewsbury Town and Telford United and um, and ice hockey. I, I kind of fell in love with ice hockey really? a bit at Radio Shropshire because Telford Tigers was the local ice hockey team, which had only okay. been going for a couple of years. Um, so I found myself going and reporting on them and doing a little bit of commentary as well. Which again, there are cassettes somewhere which will never see the light of day because I suspect it was truly awful. Um, so that was that was great. But I also then ended up doing news there too. So that's when my career, you know, took different different you know a different path as it were or or had lots and lots of different paths which yes. which came together which is very much the pattern of my career it's never been one straight path it's always been lots of paths and I should say actually as well going back to Radio Wyvern that that any any opportunity they offered me I said yes to so whether it was presenting the Saturday morning program or Sunday morning program I did for a bit or reorganizing the record library you know because we had physical records in those days um you know I would always say yes and take anything I was offered and that's my kind of was number one piece of advice to anybody starting out in their career is just follow whatever paths are put in front of you. So then you make the transition to national radio. What is that transition like? Did you apply for a job or did you get a tap on the shoulder? What was that about? Well, it was, yes, I mean, it was kind of a set of circumstances, really. Just my friend, um, my friend Sybil Roscoe, who um, was at radio we, we follow very similar paths. Actually, she was at Radio Wyvern briefly as well. Then she was at Radio Shropshire, Shropshire, which is where I got to know her. And she later on went to work for Channel 4 as their cricket reporter. 
So, um, so she's a mad cricket fan too. But she went to radio to Newsbeat and Radio One um, in about 1987, I think. And then they were looking for new young new reporters coming in. So she said, "Come and have a chat to the editor." So, so I went and and they offered me a job, which was amazing. So that was my first move to London um, in 1988, and and I had a great time at Newsbeat. Three years of learning so much about the business and how to how to tell a story how to tell a story in an, in an accessible way as well um and you know everything had to be scripted incredibly tightly um and you know so something that might take four and a half minutes to tell the story on the today program we had one and a half minutes to tell that story right. so it was an amazing discipline and i think i probably learned everything i knew about journalism actually at newsbeat having to shorten it to really punchy kind absolutely of no wasted words yeah. no wasted audio time so it was it, and still is like that it's it's a great i think it's a great program and then the move to five live and it was quite a young station at that point what was your first yeah well it was five actually live? before five live came along so it was the okay. old radio five which was this strange mixture of kids programs and sport okay so you'd have live sports so you could have a whole day of live um you know, it was Benson Hedges Cup in, in those days, you know, but kind of one day cup cricket. Right. And then you'd have some kids programmes thrown in to it as well. So it was a really peculiar mix. Um, and then f- then it became Five Live and kind of became a news and sport network um, a couple of a couple of years after that. I think about 1996, 90, 95, 96. Um, so that was, yeah, so 1991 was my first year of working in, in live sport. OK. And then so you, you go into... Obviously, a male-dominated office, especially presumably in the sports department. Mm. And this book here by Pat Murphy, BBC Sports Report, a celebration of the world's longest-running sports radio programme. You became the first female presenter of Sports Report in 1995. Talk me through that first presentation that you did. Yes, I mean, it was an amazing thing to to be given to do. I'd I'd done a few programmes, or I'd done a couple of years of presenting sports programmes and other days of the week and live football commentary and so on. And that was quite a big jump because to go from being on Newsbeat, which was very scripted, and it was all about punchy delivery, reading off a script, getting everything word perfect, to actually have much more discursive, um, live, chatty style was quite hard. So that first that first programme in 1995, I mean, it was it's just one of the most nerve-wracking things because you have... I mean, nowadays it goes on air at 12... And you've got a five-hour program of live build-up matches, commentary, you know, all the all the live football that's going on. And then at five o'clock, you have this incredibly condensed hour, intense hour of you know sp- the sports r- sports report, you know, the, the longest-running sports program in the world. And one of the most years. famous tunes. And one as of the well. most famous theme theme tunes. Yeah, the the, the out of the blue theme tune. Um, and it's that point where it's coming up, and you and the, and the clock just seems to speed up the closer you get to five o'clock, and then. Um, you have to say it's five o'clock time for sports report, and the music kicks in, and dun, you dun, just dun, 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 like that. I'm letting you sing it. Well, I'm not going to try and sing it. That's all right. No, um, it's okay. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, and and just to give some context. <laughs> um, so it was uh, it was an amazing moment, a really amazing moment, wow. and and it didn't co- quite go to plan that first program. Yes, yeah, so I want to talk to you about that. Yeah. So what what. Technically, did it? Did no, it was all fine. Yeah, no, the technical teams had were completely faultless as they always were. I mean, what happened was it was the the big match of the day was the Merseyside derby, um, and Everton won it. And Everton had been down down the bottom of the table for most of the season up to that point. And their manager at the time was Joe Royal, um, who you know had a whole string of managerial jobs over the years. And when it came to the interview, so it was the, the it was pretty much. The first thing in the programme was this live interview with Joe Royal. Um, and I think my first question was along the lines of, you know, Joe, congratulations on the win today. Um, there'll be a lot of people on the blue side of Merseyside very happy to, with you. Um, but you've been in this game long enough to know that after not a very successful start to the season, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And his response to that was only a woman would ask that question. And I don't know what was in his head. Um, I mean, subsequent, you know, subsequently I worked with him again, and, and you know, we never talked about it specifically, but we, we kind Got of made our piece. Sure, yeah, we made our piece. Sure. Um, but the problem was that it completely threw me. 
Yeah, you because said if in somebody this book. says if somebody says that to you, you know, if somebody said it to me now, I would say, well, why, why, why on earth do you say that? You know, what a strange thing to say. Why would you think that anyone would ask that question? Yeah, you said it was like being hit on the helmet while batting mm. and being expected to face the next ball far too quickly because obviously the show mm. has to carry on and you're just. I should have gone off for a head injury assessment. Probably, yeah, yeah, I mean, know. yeah. Nowadays, yeah. you know, have a concussion substitute. But. Exactly, exactly. But that's. But I think when you're building up, and, and I think with with any kind of broadcasting, actually, and any kind of live program that you do, if something knocks you off your stride at the start, it's very difficult to get back into your stride. You know, so I say like a bat, like a batter, and in an innings that gets hit on the hit on the head early on, you you can't you can't then res- resettle. Um, and, and I mean, I suppose the thing is that, you know, two things really. I mean, it, it reflected that attitude at the time that it was still a very, very unusual thing to have a woman doing that job and asking those questions. Um, and there was an attitude in some quarters that women really couldn't possibly, you know, in the same way I was talking about the cricket, that women couldn't possibly know about football. And their role in this, the sport was, you know, serving the teas or sitting in the you know, the director's box in a fur coat as the wife or partner of the chairman. Um, but it wasn't broadcasting about it or writing about it. Um, and that has changed, thank goodness. And But it took a while to change. I mean, I think the other thing is that he was, you know, and, and I learned this, I've learned this from experience now, and actually my boss at the time said this to me, he said, actually, it, immediately after a game finishes, whether you win or lose, or, or a sporting event finishes, you've got so much adrenaline in your body as the manager or the player that sometimes you'll say something stupid, you know, that that will, that will come out and it won't come out as you mean it to come out, but you, but the adrenaline is there. So probably if, if he, if it had been in a calmer time, he he wouldn't have said that. So you learned, uh, I mean, because the question was completely fair enough. It was a Mm. good journalistic question. So presumably Mm. you wouldn't change anything about. No, well, I I think, I think now I would ask that question about third or fourth in. Okay. That's interesting. So I, I think, you know, to, to, you, you, you want, you, know, you want to kind of just allow people to settle into the interview a little bit yes. now. Um, and, and I, yeah, as I say, I think with experience in almost any circumstance, you don't go powering in with your, with your, you know, your round the nose bouncer first up. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, just warm up with a few, uh, yes. not half volleys. No. <laughs> but, you know, just good, just good length balls. Just kind of gentle balls. length balls, yeah. Cricket again, love it. Um <laughs> The art of reporting, I want to ask you about that, because obviously you, you just mentioned Newsbeat really mm. sort of honed your tight news storytelling. And that's obviously crucial for a cricket report when you've got 30 seconds to sum up something you mm. could talk about forever. So for you, what is the art of reporting? What what makes a good report? It's just telling a story, isn't it? It's just you've got to know what what why this is important to people. You know, why, we, why are we talking about this? I mean, if, you, if, you, if I'm sitting doing cricket reports all day, then... The most important thing is the score. So I mean, clearly it's different in news and, and sport, but th- there, there is nothing more important than the score and the situation in the game. So, uh, you know, a 30-second rep- match report or an update has got to give the score. It's got to tell you who's on top. Um, it's then, you then maybe got a time, time for a little bit more detail, and then you give the score again. Okay. Because people's attention is quite short. Yeah. You know, so, so you might be, you know, they might say, oh, we're now going to go to Edgbaston and um, first day of the, of the test match um, and uh, Ellie Oldroyd, what's what's happening? And so you give the score at the start and then people might think, oh, they're talking about the cricket. And, and oh, what's the score again? So you yeah, yeah. have to give the score at the end. Okay. So, so but I mean, it, you know, it, what what's the secret of good reporting? I mean, that's a whole, that's a huge question, isn't it, really? And it yeah. depends on what area you're, you're talking about. But, but I think it's, you've got to be clear. You've got to use clear language. You've got to... Try and simplify things as much as possible for people who, for whom these are complicated subjects. And actually, going back to Newsbeat, that was one of the things that I've learned when it comes to working on Five Live now. That if you've got to try and explain a story to a younger audience, you know, your audience of teenagers and and young adults, y- you you can't assume any knowledge. So if you don't understand it, then they're not going to understand it. So since your first report of, of a cricket match I mean presumably when you first did it you, you, you got the butterflies and you remember do, do you still get butterflies now? I'd, less so with something like that I mean it depends it depends if you know that it's a it's a crucial point in the game um, 
then you do. You know, you are, so so for example, during the Ben Stokes innings at Headingley in 2019, you know, every time they came to you, you're thinking, how on earth am I going to explain this? Because this is just the most bonkers thing I've ever seen in my whole life. You know, you've gone from absolutely guaranteed losing this to suddenly coming within touching distance of the most unlikely win of all time with nine wickets down, you know, so last gasp, last gasp win or last chance win. So you, you're thinking, right, I've got to make sure I've got this right and I can tell this story properly. But I think with experience, you you, you get better at, at things which are familiar. It's the things which are unfamiliar that make you more nervous. And how do you prepare for a test match beforehand? So stats, are they a big thing for you going in? Um, it's, it's knowing what stats to use. Yeah. You know, I mean, Andy Zaltzman is the test match special scorer and so he will have he has a stat sheet which has everything you could possibly want to know on it but you you know you, I'm not really focusing hugely on on that because because I'm talking to a, a Radio 5 Live audience so it's you know you've got test match special which is on Sports Extra and if you are a, an absolutely obsessive cricket fan you're going to listen to TMS all day so you know I might say I might say to my mum oh I've been at Lords this week you know and she'll say oh well you do I'd I, I was listening to Test Match Special. I'm sorry I didn't hear you. So that's my 91 year old mum. Um, but um, but you you are you're, you're not sort of thinking. You know you're thinking about the headline stories on Five Live. You know you're talking to people who have a little bit of an interest in cricket, but then but not so much they're going to listen to it all day. So you have to say this is really interesting and exciting, and you know so, so it's just knowing what those those key stories are. Um, but yes, I mean ideally, you know you've. At the start of the summer, so the start of this summer, for example, when it comes to the men's ashes, I'll be sitting down and making notes about everybody. And But hopefully, obviously, these are players that most of us know quite well. Mm. What's harder is doing something like the Commonwealth Games last summer, where it was obviously the, the women's T20 at, at, in Birmingham. And a lot of the teams I knew nothing about yes. at all. So, you know, you've got to kind of try and get, get some good stories around the Pakistan team or the Bangladesh team you might not know as well as the Australians or certainly the England team or a little bit the South African team as well. Mm. So so having useful facts that you can use. I mean you, you can't know about everything. But right. um but if you if you can make it as I mean ideally you it, you know you you can if you can know as much as you possibly can. You're not you're not going to use it all. But you can't be you can't be over prepared I don't think. So before an Olympics, I mean, that's even broader because you, mm. you've probably covered every sport under the sun. Yeah, honest. yes. I mean, you, uh, you said that there's seven Olympics. It's actually uh, 12 Olympics if you put the, the winter, winter Olympics, Olympics in, as into well. it as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yes, I mean, I've, prob I've prob probably covered or have a knowledge of most of the Olympic sports. Um, and some of the Olympic sports are not dissimilar. So if you, you've got the, you know, obviously you've got the, the sports, you know, the running sports, the swimming sports, the speed, speed, endurance, everything is timed, first over the line, that kind of thing. Or you've then got the marked sports. So, you know, I've done figure skating, I've done gymnastics, um, you know, I've done synchronised swimming randomly as well. Or, you know, you, or you've got the combat sports. So, you know, I've covered judo and taekwondo and I've been to boxing. Um, and, you know, and then, and then there's hockey, netball, the, the football the sports that where you score points so so you can kind of break them down a little bit and you can say well I've never covered I don't know um taekwondo before but it's like, okay the scoring is a little bit like like judo and it's about beating your opponent so most sports you can access in some way by knowledge that you've got before but with the synchronized swimming for example you know pre preparing for that so I went to the British Championships kind of qualifying tournament beforehand or qualifying event beforehand um, and so you learn about how important it is, you know, physically, the breath control, the, the, you know, the physical demands of having that incredible core strength, the, the grace, the ability to, as they say, it's like running a 400 metres race while smiling and wearing a nose clip and full makeup um, okay, and, un and underwater. Yeah, um, wow. So, so in, in endurance terms, so so it's kind of breaking it down and making finding those little accessible things. It's about being accessible, isn't it? Because you're not, mm. in, especially with the Olympics, you're you're not broadcasting mainly to people who are experts in that sport. No, so it's, absolutely. It's good to hear from someone like you, who's also not an expert, but making it accessible well. That's the thing. It, it's possible. finding it's it's bridging that gap. It's finding the the gap between the people who have literally no idea about a sport, and then the people who dedicated their whole lives to that sport. So. 
you know, so so I might start the prep for an Olympic um, modern pentathlon. So that's one of the sports I've covered quite a bit before I covered it for the first time. And I know that the modern pentathlon community are absolutely dedicated to the sport. And they might know that amount, you know, this is kind of visual thing, right up there. And I might know that amount right down next to the table. But then when it comes to the games, the people I'm talking to are down yes. hand, hand next to the table. So I've got to try and be somewhere but still closer to them yes. than to the experts. But but for anybody who is an expert, I don't want them to be incredibly annoyed with what yes. I'm saying. Yes, OK. So it's a balancing act. So it is a balancing act. Brilliant. Olympic memories, you must have loads, but pick out a couple yeah. that really oh. stand out. Well, I mean, Sydney was amazing. I absolutely loved the Sydney Olympics because they're as passionate about all sports as we are. Yeah. Um, I'd never been to Australia before and I'd always want, been desperate to go to Australia as a cricket fan. I was always dying to go to Australia. Um, we actually had my, my daughter, so my, my youngest, my eldest daughter was seven months old at the time. Oh, wow. So, but because my, you know, my then husband was, was working on the games as well, he, he was commentating. So we managed to take her out with us, which was amazing. And, yeah, and her grandma came out too and looked after us. So, so they had the most fantastic time. Um, but sitting on the steps of Sydney Opera House, presenting a program on the first night of the games before the opening ceremony, you know, preview show, because they'd set up broadcast booths on, on the steps of the Opera House. Um, that was unbelievable. And also in those games, you know, I had Denise Lewis winning the gold medal in the, in the heptathlon. Um, I, I mean, London was, you know, London was also, I think, probably my favourite games. Just partly because, you know, as I say, having had that, you know, I mean, my, my kids are, my oldest was born in 2000, but all the way through their childhood, there was a point where both their parents would just disappear off to do the Olympics or the Paralympics or both. Um, and so to be able to say to them at London, do you understand now why mummy and daddy disappear every so often to, to go to a big sporting event and for it to be in their city and on their doorstep, that was amazing because I just wanted to be able to say to them, this is what it's like and this is what it's all about and this is why I, I love the Olympic Games. So so that's my, that, that's my it's, it's been some of the most special and exciting times in my life. Just quickly, an opening ceremony must be a crazy thing to prepare for. Yes, as well. I mean I've never never worked on the opening ceremony as such. Um, yeah, I mean you you look at Hazel Irvin or Andrew Cotter, and the amount of prep they do is is mad. You know they have big sheets with every detail about Papua New Guinea or you know um, uh, you know St Vincent and the Grenadines. It's it's all there to hand, so they they can and, and all in the right order as well. Um, so I've been to the I went to the opening ceremony rehearsal for Beijing, and I mean, and you just knew that was going to be spectacular because of the you know the, the uh, absolutely in synchronized drummers and it was quite it was quite something it was quite a controlled games that and there's, I mean you know the politics around the Olympics are always staggering and probably my least favorite Olympics was the Sochi Winter Olympics for that that reason yeah um, because you just knew that it was you were all part of a great you know scheme by. Yeah. Vladimir Putin to make Russia look as good as it to possibly could. To sanitise the country through sports. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If there's anything that's watched or has been watched more than an Olympic Games, it's Her Late Majesty's funeral, and more people tuned into that than mm. any other event in history. You've been covering royal events. What was your first royal first, event that you covered? First one was Princess Diana's funeral. Okay. Um, which was, yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely incredible, partly because none of us had any chance to prepare for it. In any way, mentally. I mean, like the whole country just didn't, couldn't prepare for it at all. So take us into your head well, at that time. Yeah, I mean, it was, I was actually on air. It was on, on the, the day that she died, I was due to be doing a sports programme because it was a Sunday. So at the time I did the Sunday afternoon show on Five Live. So I woke up in the morning expecting to be preparing for whatever the football was that afternoon and instead um, switched the radio on. It's one of those moments that you never forget, never forget what you would you were doing I was just in the bathroom switched the radio on and it was on Radio 4 and I thought well, why is it on Radio 4 because normally it would be on 5 Live but it was Jim Nocherty's voice um, and he said uh, Prince Charles will now be waking his sons to tell them that their mother is dead and you just think oh my god wow and uh, it, it, you know I, as I picture exactly where I was when I heard it um, but at that point I, I then went phoned to the office and they said well obviously there's no sport today but I went in and I then presented the news the rolling news program in the afternoon um on five live and then on radio four we came together and did a joint program with radio four um and then when it came to the day of the funeral 
they, the, I mean, the tradition, I mean, just to kind of slightly explain why a sports broadcaster would be doing doing something like this, there's always been a tradition going back from the start to the start of the BBC of sports broadcasters being brought in to do big ceremonial occasions because you can talk off the top of your head and you can paint a picture and describe a scene and sum up a mood. Um, and and so that's why, you know, going all the way back to well, the Queen's coronation and before, um, there have always been sports people at the heart of it. And, you know, you have to, pre- obviously you have to prepare, you have to know exactly what you're looking at, you have to be able to write down and describe the coffin, you know, the the, the procession beforehand, the, the you know, the mounted um, you know, troops, whatever, who, whoever is in the procession, um, and, and where they're from and what they're wearing. So you, you write all of these things down, but what you can't do is prepare yourself for the feeling of that that moment. And so the point when the procession came out of Kensington Palace and then started going down Kensington Gore, which is where I was, so just inside Kensington Gardens, there was this wail from the crowd and it was this woman who just seen the coffin and just, you know, it was unearthly sound. And I can't remember what I said and I've never not listened to it back, but I think it was just that feeling of, you know, the, the raw emotion coming out among the crowd. Um, and so they are quite difficult things to prepare for because you've got to be able to have all your facts at your fingertips, but you've also got to be able to be aware of what's going on around and, and you know, sum up that feeling of, of being there and get the tone right and get the pace right. And again, it's something you get better at doing. So that was the first. And then I've, I've done, so I did the Queen Mother's funeral as well in 2002. Um, I did William and Catherine's wedding, Charles and Camilla's wedding, and then Meghan and Harry's wedding inside St George's Chapel. And that was, and that's a different thing. So that then that that took me inside the service, you know. So so at the heart of the ceremonial <clears throat> is always the, the you know the funeral or the wedding, um, and to be in in that position of just knowing when to speak, when not to speak. Again, to get the tone right, to get the pace right, to sum up the the joyfulness or the solemnity of a of a church service, and I think this is where it brings in my particularly niche skill set of being a sports broadcaster, who was also a vicar's daughter. So, spent my life going to church when I was younger, and you know, and and still do go to church now, and also singing in a choir. So, knowing a bit what the music sounds like and and how that fits into the service too. So, so I have yeah, I've got a particular particular group of, of, sk- of skills which not many people have to be able to do that and I've seen your notes from um, preparation for um, the most recent funeral Her Majesty's funeral and some of the anecdotes you've got on there are great so you've got Nelson Mandela how he used to mm. uh, ring up and say hello Elizabeth how's the Duke mm. and Mahatma Gandhi giving her a woven cloth as a wedding present yeah and so it's those anecdotes that just keep it alive where do you find those yes um I well just research you know I just just went back I you know I googled because I knew that at the, at, for the the lying in state for the the, queen, the queen's funeral, so I was in Westminster for that. Um, so I was in St Paul's Cathedral for the service at the start of the week, and then Westminster top of Westminster Hall for the procession to the lying in state. And so I knew that, yeah. You know, and and the producers will break these things down on the processional route and say, okay, you're going to be overlooking Parliament Square, where I was due to be in Parliament Square, but then the commentary box just didn't get built in time. Um, so. Think about the things that you might talk about. So if there's a long delay, because you don't know whether the, whether the procession might somehow get held up in Whitehall for whatever reason, you know, um, or you might suddenly find that you've got longer to speak because the line of the commentator further up the line from you might have gone down or the, or the microphone might have failed. So suddenly you might have five minutes to fill instead of three minutes to fill. Yeah. So... So I, d- I thought, right, okay, well, there's the statue of Mahatma Gandhi and there's the statue of Churchill, which was, you see very clearly on Parliament Square. So I went away and just Googled, you know, little little stories. And there were lots of stories, actually, in the week running up to the funeral in the papers about her relationship with Churchill. Um, in the end, I didn't think I had time to use all of those things because because actually the microphone, all the microphones worked, but my um, the talkback from the studio failed. So they were trying to cue to me and I couldn't hear them cueing to me. And you can't just start talking in the middle of a sentence, you know, in case they in case they fade you up. So actually, I had less time than I thought I was going to have for that particular moment. But it was the the moment, the, the key bit of you know the procession coming into um, New Palace Yard by the 
west door of, of Westminster Hall and then the coffin coming off the, the gun carriage and being taken inside. So again, it's just it's it's preparing for the um, you know the, the uniforms of the Blues and Royals and the, the mounted divisions of the Household Cavalry and so on. So, so but again, this is stuff that you only ever have to lo- know about at a very specific time. Yeah, literally once in a lifetime. L- literally once in a lifetime, or a couple of times in a, a couple lifetime. of couple of times for the different events. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and then, but but then to be in in the service itself was just quite an astonishing thing for the Queen's yeah. funeral and for the Duke's Duke of Edinburgh's funeral as well. Um, because you've got to be very conscious of how people are feeling when you're talking. So that's all about getting the, the tone and the pace right. And and that is something I really do think I couldn't have done in my 30s or even my 40s. Very interesting. Why, why just, just because of life I think experience? Life experience and experience as a broadcaster as well. And just not being... I've said, I've said a few times, it's a little bit like going to play... You know, just imagine that, Will, that you've been called up to f- play for England and yep. you're about to make your debut at Lord's. I've and imagined that many times. Yeah, <laughs> and you're walking out of the pavilion and down from the dressing room and down those famous stairs, and you're remembering not to go too far down into the basement and and g- g- getting it and the gents lose, but you remember to walk through the long room and you're walking through the long room and you're walking out to the middle, and if you've, if you'd never been to Lords before, and you'd never experienced anything like that before, ninety percent of what you're feeling is terror, I think, and just the unfamiliarity of the surroundings. So for me to be have been able to have done, you know, Harry and Meghan's wedding and then the Duke, the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral as well. By the time we got to the Queen's funeral, I had that experience. So I wasn't intimidated by being in the chapel and in this little box which overlooks the altar of St George's Chapel, which is only radio have that position. You know, so I was the only journalist broadcaster in inside the, the service. Um, but if I'd never done any of that before... And we rehearsed it as well. So we, we wrote a script, you know, to fit into the different bits of the service. And we did a full rehearsal of that over the ch- over the rehearsal footage or over the recording of the rehearsal the day before the, the, the Queen's funeral. So or actually the morning of the Queen's funeral we did it. And were there any tips you picked up on having rehearsed it? That yeah, oh yes, adjust? absolutely. Well, there were, there were things like, so for example, the, um, the, the piper, the lone piper, um, we'd written words because you've got because it's radio you know if you're watching it on tv you don't need any words really you know you you might just say you know the archbishop of canterbury or um the anthem is um bring us O lord god by william henry harris um and and there might be a line in that where, where i think because i think william henry harris actually taught the queen to play piano oh wow so um so you might have a detail of that in, on TV, but on radio, you've got to paint a picture. You know, you have to be able to... to be, people, you know, people can hear what's going on, but they might need to know that the piper is now going to walk from uh, uh, along the, the north aisle of, of the, the chapel and then out through the, the east door or whatever door yeah. it was. But when we'd rehearsed it and we'd, we'd, call, record, you know, we'd recorded the, the rehearsal, we then listened to it and thought, Right, right, okay, we can't say any, we've just got to cut all of this because actually people are going to want to listen to the piper. Yeah. Because that is the moment, that's the most important thing. You know, nothing I can say is going to be more important than the sound of of the piper, that unbelievably, you know, poignant and heartbreaking and, um, yeah, uh, you know, the Queen had a piper outside her window every single day of her life. So it was a deeply significant moment of the service. And I'm very glad I'd, knew not to talk over it so i want to talk about choral music one of your great passions probably you're in your top two with cricket high up there high High up up there there. um and firstly can i recommend if you haven't heard it already perfect pitch is ellie's (laughs) half an hour masterpiece about (laughs) how cricket and choral music overlap and you've chatted Mm. to alistair cook Emily rainford brent graham fowler Mm -hmm. clive lloyd Mm -hmm. sir clive lloyd sir alistair cook in fact and um there's so much overlap. And Alison yes. Cook talks about learning discipline from it. Ebony Rainford Brent talks about harmonising, Graham Fowler about flow. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's so that there are so many overlaps and links with cricket, but what about broadcasting? How is your kind of grounding in music and vocals? How has that shaped what you do today on the mic? It's an interesting thought, actually. And look, I suppose. I mean, pa- pacing is important, I suppose. That, that's, that's the thing. I mean, my singing background is that 
I'm, you know, I'm not a brilliant singer by any means, but I just sang in choirs all the way through my childhood and into university life and then stopped for ages. Um, and, you know, my kids were little. Actually, when my daughter started, wanted to sing in the choir. So I started singing in the same choir or the adult adult um, section of the same choir in my church in, in Barnes. And um, so that was something that, you know, I've always loved and found very... I mean, I, I, you know, it's an interesting question that you ask because I don't know what what the overlaps are. Maybe I need to think about that and yeah, do another documentary about yeah, it. Yeah, piece two. Um, <laughs> but um, it's it for for me. I, I mean, in a way, choral music takes me away from the the day job. You know, it takes me to on a Sunday morning if I if I manage to make it to church, which is always a bit of a struggle because I do a, the breakfast program till ten o'clock in the morning, so it's a bit of a race to get there. Or Choir practice on a Wednesday evening. It's just very different from anything else, um, and you know, and you, you. But you have to obviously, you know, you're learning, you're learning the structure of a piece. You know, you're having to to learn how, um, when to when to speak, when to, when to sing, when to not sing. You know, when when there are bar rests and and to, but to keep the focus and to keep the keep your you know concentration levels through that time as well. And actually, that's that's quite quite a good similarity because there are times if you're doing a program on a, if I'm doing a program on Saturday morning and I'm a bit tired and and my co-presenter is Chris Warburton is doing the piece and and I might just kind of mentally switch off a little bit and then suddenly I've got to get back in and think oh my god I'm going to be, be, be late on that um but the cricket inquires thing came about really because um one of my one of my best friends is produces Coral Evensong on Radio 3 Every week, so that's your favourite thing to listen to, isn't it? And that's my favourite thing to listen to, particularly in the bath. Actually, if sometimes I'll you know, have it on BBC Sounds, it's just utter relaxation. Um, but it's, but it's, it, as I say, it's it's something that it's quite hard to describe really how how it can be such an uplifting, but you know, centering and calming thing at the same time. Um, so. It's been lovely to bring it into my broadcasting life, actually. And so the documentary with with you know my friend Ben, who's produced Coral Eden Song, um, it came about because we were sitting in a pub, um, funnily enough, and talking about cricket. And he's a mad cricket fan, and obviously I'm a mad choral music fan. And we started saying, well, is there a way of bringing these two things together? And and um, and somehow we managed to persuade Radio Four that there was. <laughs> And so we did a documentary on it, and it was great. And I just loved the fact the music, you know, the music and the co- cricket commentary. I could I could hear how it was going to sound before we even made it. And you know, and and that we we actually mic'd up. We had them, them, them took a feed from the stump mic at Old Trafford for all of the background sounds of the players talking to each other, and and you know the the uh, the, the ball hitting the the bat and and so on. So it was just a wonderful piece of radio to make, and and Ben did an absolutely awesome job in producing it as well. Go and have a listen; it is phenomenal. I'm going to finish with some quick fire questions. Firstly, Ellie, um, one lesson, the the biggest lesson that you've learned from your time in broadcasting, or the best advice you've been given. Uh, it's not heart surgery. It's not a matter of life or death. If things go wrong, I mean, ideally, when you're when you're commentating on the Queen's funeral, things won't go wrong. So you've got to try and prepare yourself for, for every eventuality and things that might go wrong. But it is absolutely, it's it's enjoyment. It's it's pleasurable. I mean, one of the great things. I mean, I love radio. Radio is my thing. TV is fine, but it's not what I love. Um, during the pandemic, when we were doing a lot of programs, talking to people directly at home. So everybody, of, of all the big news stories I've covered over the years, nothing has been like the pandemic because everybody was literally in the same place. Nobody could leave their houses. I was sitting with a microphone in my bedroom doing the breakfast programme with Chris in his bedroom, um, you know, in Salford, and I was in London. And it, just the way you can talk to people in a situation like that, there it's the m- biggest privilege. You know, there's nothing more intimate than radio and just that the sound of your voice and the way that you can just communicate with with the audience and I used to finish every program and think wow gosh this is such a privilege to be in people's lives and at, at a time of national trauma really what a great answer if you hit a hundred at Lords who would you want commentating on the stroke that brought you to three figures. Well, I mean, we are now in the realms of utter fantasy because I was 
a completely hopeless at sport at school. <laughs> you know, I could, I, I'd be amazed to even score one at Lords. Um, I think it would be a combination of Daniel Norcross and Ebony Rainford Brent. Brilliant. Who are my two, fa- two of my absolute favourite people as well as my favourite commentators. Fantastic. Will Arsenal win the Premier League? Oh, I want to say yes. I, I, I mean, I, I have, I have you know, supported Arsenal on and off really since the late, late 80s, in that period of success. <laughs> um, and I've not been able to go very much in the last few years. And I'm trying not to jinx it. So um, I'm going to say if they can manage to get through March without losing every game, then yes. Some big games coming yeah, up. Yeah, but March is big. March is going to be huge. Will England, men's team, win the Ashes? Yes. I say that with a lot more confidence. Um, and you can, you know, you get me back here and say, how could you possibly have so much confidence? Well, we definitely will. Um, but yeah, I think I think the way that they're playing at the moment with Brendan McCullum and I think the way that the Australians are, I mean, you know, the Australians are incredibly competitive, but I think they are, I'm not sure that Warner and Kawaja are going to be around for all that long you know again I might be proved completely wrong so they've got some really terrific players Australia Um, but I wouldn't say they're that much better than England at the moment we shall see I mean man for man everyone knows who the most exciting team is as far as the women's ashes it's a much easier one I think Australia are going to win that yes but you know with the hundred and with England's women's cricket going like this Mm. as it is I mean Absolutely, there's very exciting, future. very exciting future for the for the for the England women's team, I think. And finally, if there's one event that you've commentated on or covered, or one show you've done that you just you, you just want to do it again because you enjoyed it so much, what would it be? Goodness me, I think probably uh, it's it's funny because you think about in these things in retrospect, but I mean it'd be a combination that the summer of 2019 when it was the the World Cup final at Lords, the men's World Cup final at Lords. And then a few weeks later, the Headingley Test match, which was Ben Stokes's finest hour. I would love to go back and do those again, knowing what the result would be, because at the time it was absolute torture. <laughs> because you just thought there's no way you know England are going to lose this, and and then you, you know you the thing is with something like that, which is so close, you don't know that it's the most amazing day of your life until it's over in a way. Mm. Until he hammers it for four. Until he hammers it for four, <laughs> absolutely. Brilliant. And just one final question. Um, you've had an, an Oz career, you've done lots of different things. A um, couple of people who you're, you're kind of most grateful for, for giving you the passion you've got now and the opportunities. I, sp- I mean, I suppose my, my family, you know, my parents and the love of sport, because without them, um, it would be, I would, I'd, I'd probably be doing something a lot more boring. Um, and I suppose, actually, my first boss in local radio, David Holdsworth, who who put me on the radio for the first time and recognised, and this is about day three of a week when I was doing work experience and worked out that actually I was a broadcaster because I didn't know I was a broadcaster until then. Well, we all know you are now, Ellie. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it's you've been, been pleasure. Yeah, it's been awesome to have you for the first episode of I Know That Voice. Thank you for listening or watching. There are so many more to come and it's been a joy to speak to such a radio legend. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>